Okay, so in this video, we're gonna go ahead and start trying to analyze some recursive code. Uh, so we're gonna introduce a few new concepts of how and, and tools to do this analysis. Um, we'll say, give you kind of a framework for what we're gonna be thinking about is usually recursive code tends to fall into one of three common patterns when it comes to things we wanna analyze using the tools we'll introduce. So first we're gonna start by talking about our first pattern, which is what we call the ha having the input pattern. And we're gonna talk about binary search. To give you a little preview of where we're going for the rest of this lecture, in this video, we're only gonna be talking about code modeling. And in the next lecture, we're gonna be talking about asymptotic analysis. Sorry, not next lecture, next video. So let's go ahead and describe this algorithm binary search. So binary search is probably something that uh, we introduced to you in CSE 143. It's kind of just one of kind of like the top 10 algorithms in terms of things that are very cool to show off. They're relatively simple to understand. The coding it up is not the easiest, but we show it off as an example of what an algorithm is kind of separate that from the code itself. The idea of binary search is you're given an array of values and they're sorted. Um, and you are gonna go through and try to find a certain value um, doing something slightly faster than searching through every single index. And so the intuition you wanna have for binary search is like what you do if you went, you're, if you're gonna go shopping for clothes. It's like if I went to uh, the store and they had a wall of shirts uh, along the wall that are sorted by size, I know I'm like a medium or a large. So I'm not gonna start at the very left side with the extra, 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 extra smalls and work my way up through every single shirt. No, I know I'm gonna be, you know, the best place to look is somewhere in the middle and then see if my size is larger or smaller than that so I can guide my search left and right. Binary search is just the codification of this idea applied to arrays of numbers. So you have a sorted array that we called R in this, in this code, and we're looking for the value to find. And the idea of binary search is you have this low index and high index. And these two indices kind of tell you where you're searching at every point in time. Now in binary, the, the code here is not gonna be the most important thing. We just wanna show you this kind of common structure on a real algorithm. Most recursive code starts with a base case. How do you know when you're done? In the case of binary search, you know you're done when low and high, the range of the array you're looking at, is, are right next to each other. There's only one thing left. And so here you do some work to figure out like, oh, is it the value I'm looking for or is this not in the array in which I could return negative one? Otherwise, you go into the recursive case, meaning that there's a lot of array left to process. And so what we do is we compute the midpoint, look at the value in the middle, and if that value is smaller than the value we're looking for, we know we can eliminate the left half of the array because the value looking at, we're looking for is larger than the midpoint, then it's gonna be in the right half of the array. So we can eliminate half. And conversely, if, uh, if the value in the middle is larger than our number, we can eliminate the right half. So it's okay in your recursive cases to have some non-recursive work, right? Like computing the midpoint and having these if statements. That's totally fine. But then the, the, meat, the meaty part of this is in those if-else statements, they make a recursive call. And importantly, every time you call one of these methods, the parameters you pass in reduce the size of the problem. So in binary search, we always cut the array in half, essentially. And so that eliminates half the array every time. That's why we say it falls in this first pattern of having the input. So it's really important to recognize that every recursive call, we're going to be looking at a smaller and smaller section of the array. To give you a bit more visual explanation of what's going on here, binary search is an algorithm to find that target value in a sorted array. And that sorted keyword there is really important because it's, this is not gonna be guaranteed to work if, uh, if it's not sorted. And so we're gonna successfully, uh, successfully eliminate half the array. So say we're looking for the value 42, we start low and high at the ends, compute the midpoint to be 30. Well, 42 is greater than 30. And so since I know the array is sorted, I can easily just get rid of the left half of the array. I don't need that left to look at anywhere in that left half because I know 42 can't be there. And now I update low to be bigger than the midpoint, the old midpoint. And now I look in our next recursive call between low and high. And so then I would say, oh, well, the mid, oops, sorry, the midpoint there is 56. 42 is less than 56. So it has to be on the left side of that midpoint. So I can eliminate the right side of that half of the array. And then I can continue this process. I compute the midpoint, I see it's 42, and I can return index 10. And you could just keep, you would keep going until there's only one thing you're looking at. Um, 
in which case if it's not the value you're looking for you return negative one so let's try to consider what's the runtime of this what what's the runtime of this method so it, we did some for this array of 17 elements we did something like three recursive calls the first initial call cut in half once cut in half again cut in half one last time to find our value so that's a relatively small number of operations for an array of 17 elements. Now, it's probably pretty clear here that this runtime is not gonna be big O of one in the worst case, where we have to search through all of these things. Why is that? Well, if I have a billion elements in my array, it's unlikely that this algorithm is really running in constant time. Like it, does, it doesn't scale at all with the input size. So I wouldn't say it's going to be big O of 1. And we could definitely probably say that this will be big O of n, but that seems to be kind of a loose bound because I didn't have to look through all 17 elements. So while it might scale somewhat with n, it might not be a linear relationship. It might be something better than n. So the first step in ever trying to actually try to answer these questions is we need to come up with a code model. And then once we come up with that code model, we can run, do asymptotic analysis on it. So if we consider this, um, this array, this um, code model is a little complex. I kind of hinted at this in my, in my discussion of this earlier, because it really depends not just on the input size, but on what values are in the array and what we're looking for, which means we know we're gonna need to do case analysis. So what's the best case? Take a second to think about that. What was the best case for binary search? On, again, regardless of the size of the array, because that's not what we consider best case. Yeah, it would be something like if you're looking for the element that's right in the middle. So you could just look at the middle on the first, uh, the first recursive step and just return right away. So if we found it at the midpoint right away, then our runtime function would be something like f of n equals one. That means no matter how big the array is, we did something like one step. And remember, you get to hand wave constants because we're gonna throw them away anyways. So maybe it's more like two or three, but it's constant. And then we can now do our asymptotic analysis on this function and come up with the fact that this is big theta of one. Okay, well then what's the worst case? What could the worst possible case for this algorithm be? I would argue it's if you're uh, finding an element that's not in the array. If it's not in the array, you have to keep cutting the array in half over and over again until there's only one element left. And so then our runtime is going to be something related to how many times can I divide this array's length by two. But that's not really easy to come up with a formula for that. So the runtime, I would argue, is related to the number of times we can half the array. How many times does it take? If you start at n, how many times can you divide by two before you get down to a single element? I think it's a bit easier to think about this problem in reverse. How many times do I have to multiply two by itself to get to n? So instead of saying how many times do I divide n by two, how many times do I multiply two by itself to get n? We'll call that number of multiplications x, and so we need to solve an equation of the form two to the x equals n, and we need to figure out what x is so that we can figure out how many times we divide it by two. Well, if you remember from your algebra classes, they taught you this log operation. You take the log of both sides and you find that this magic number x, the number of times you have to multiply by two, is gonna be log base two of n. So this means our binary search is gonna be in the logarithmic complexity class, meaning that it's gonna be something about log here, not linear, not quadratic, etc. So as a reminder, a kind of mathematical reminder of what logarithms are, logs are the inverse of exponentials. So when you say y is equal to log b of x, that's saying b to the y is equal to x. You're finding how many times do you have to raise b to uh, multiply b by itself to get to x. And so some examples, since 2 squared is 4, log base 2 of 4 is 2. How many times do you have to multiply 2 by itself to get 4? It's 2 times. And then similarly, log base 3 of 9 is 2 because 3 squared is 9. And this log function grows really slowly as n gets larger and larger, which is one of these really nice properties of log. Logarithmic algorithms are fantastic because they grow so slowly. Now, I kind of hand-waved a lot here when talking about this. 
I, I said, oh, well, I would argue that the runtime is going to be related to the number of times you divide it by half. But what we really have done here is done kind of a, a leap of intuition. We started out on the right path where we identified a best case and a worst case. But to get to our runtime bounds to say, oh, this is a logarithmic complexity class or this is constant class, we, we kind of just used big brain intuition there, which was not necessarily rigorous and does not necessarily make sense unless you kind of really remember your logarithms. And so I would argue here that this type of approach is not going to work out for us once we get to even moderately more complex examples. We didn't come up with an explicit runtime function for our worst case and then said like, oh, this would then be big theta of log n. So we need something more concrete. We need something more methodical so we can go about doing tackling more challenging problems. So what we want is we want to use our tool chain. We want to use formal case analysis and then asymptotic analysis. But with what we had right now, we already separated into cases, which was good, but we had trouble, I think, except in the best case, coming up with what is the runtime function. And we need a tool that will help us come up with runtime functions for recursive code. So in the rest of this video, we're gonna talk about that tool. And again, as context, this tool's job is to come up with a runtime function. It is not this tool's job to come up with a big O bound or a big theta bound. That's the job of asymptotic analysis, and we'll get there in the next video. Okay, so right now we're just in step one, come up with runtime functions. So it would be nice, it, when we're looking at this, um, this code, when we're trying to come up with a runtime model, to use something like what we had before, where we kind of count steps. So I would start with my base case and I'd say, okay, well, in this base case, I do something like two steps because I do an if statement and a return. Remember, the exact constants aren't going to matter here. So this is the time where if you're like, why did he choose the number two there? That's the wrong question to ask. It's just constants. So we need to get out of that mindset that constants matter here. And then something like these steps would be something like plus four. Then um, our recursive case would have you know, some constant work to like to compute the midpoint and do this if statement. But then how do I go about modeling the, those recursive calls? Those recursive calls, how long does it take to make one of those? You know, what would be really handy was if I had some kind of function that said for any input size n, how many steps an algorithm would take. Oh, that's what we're trying to come up with right now. We're trying to come up with a runtime function that says binary search will take this many steps if you give it input size n. So as a hint, the tool we're going to use to come up with these runtime functions is going to use itself in its formula. And this is where we enter the idea of a recurrence. A recurrence relation is an equation that defines a sequence based on rules that gives the next term um, as a function of the previous terms. So this is going to look a lot like recursion, but now it's a recursion of a mathematical function, where the runtime function is determined in terms of itself. So in this slide, um, I show you an example of recurrence down at the bottom. I'll explain how to read that in just one second. But just as a note, we're going to use capital T as our function name for recurrences by convention and to give a hint that it's a recurrence and not just a plain old simple function. So our recurrences are going to look a lot like recursion, recurs, recursive code. They're going to have base cases. What happens if the input's small? It's going to be usually some kind of constant number or something. And then it should include, well, what happens if the value is larger? And so our function t of n is defined as, well, if n is less than 3, its work is going to be 5. It's going to do 5 steps. Otherwise, it's going to do something like 2 times of the evaluation of t of n divided by two. So it's gonna go evaluate that same function on a smaller input, return back the number of steps it took, and we multiply that by two, and then we also add on 10. This is just a generic example. It has nothing to do with binary search that we just did, but these are what the recurrences generally look like. Um, usually you'll have a case in your recurrence relation for each kind of distinct case in your code. So in this example, we'd have like a distinct base case and a distinct recursive case. And so it makes sense for us to have two things here. 
this has been awfully abstract. I think this makes a little bit more sense when we try to tackle a concrete example. So here is an, another recursive example. It's not binary search, it's just a different recursive uh, example. It has a base case that like returns 80 if n is less than three. Otherwise it computes some value a, uh, makes some recursive calls on n divided by three, and then returns those. So let's try using our counting steps to come up with some, some counts. So this base case would be something like two steps. Then our recursive case, everything after the base case, has some amount of constant work that a equals n times two could be like two steps. The return value one plus value two could also be like two steps. Um, so our non-recursive work in this recursive case would be something like plus four. And then the question is, well, how much recursive work do we do? Well, we are going to have to figure out what is the number of steps making a recursive call on n divided by three is. So we need to have a function that tells us, well, what is the number of steps this function, this uh, method will take? And we need to do that twice because we make this recursive call twice. So our recursive work here will be something like two times n divided by three. T of n divided by three tells me how many steps this algorithm takes when you give it an input size of n divided by three. That's gonna return some number of steps, maybe 200 steps, I don't know. And then we multiply that by two because we made that call twice. So then our overall recurrence will be t of n equals two if n is less than three. Why two? Well, it's because that's how many steps we make in the base case. And when do we enter the base case? When n is less than three. And then in our recursive case, we have some recursive work, two times t of n divided by three, then plus our non-recursive work here, plus four otherwise. So this function now defines what's our runtime for any input of n. If you give it n is two, the runtime is two. If you give it a bigger runtime, you have to evaluate some more recursive calls to figure that out. Now note, this looks really weird at first, and I agree, recurrences look weird. It is absolutely not obvious at all how you're gonna be able to take this t of n and turn it into an asymptotic bound. Like here's this recurrence relation. Is it big O of n squared? I don't know, but that's not our goal in this video. Our goal in this video is to just be able to come up with these recurrence relations. The next video is gonna talk about how do we take a recurrence and turn it to an asymptotic bound. So this is just defining a function that tells us the number of steps. And so again, we are just in the code modeling step. Let's try another example. So this is an example that includes some for loops as well. So in my, uh, it's a very similar example, but now if you flip back, you see instead of just doing some constant work there, I now have a for loop here. So I'm gonna loop n times. The process is exactly the same. In the base case, I do something like two steps. In my recursive case, I do something now like n plus two non-recursive work. So my for loop will take something like n steps, and then that return statement at the end will be something like two steps. So I have some non-recursive work here that's something like plus n plus two. And my recursive work is, since it's the exact same example, we have two times uh, t of n divided by three. And so you put all these pieces together to get a runtime for a recurrence that's t of n is equal to two if n is less than three. Otherwise, it's two times t of n over three plus n divided by two. Okay? So still kind of weird. But now I wanna give you a chance to try one of these, try to practice this. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of our setup for this and what I want you to input here before the video pauses. So we're going to have this recursive code and I'm gonna do some of the counting for you. So I'm gonna start with the base case being plus two steps. In our recursive case, we have some n plus three non-recursive work. Our for loop runs n times and then we do something like three steps at the bottom. And now I want us to figure out what is the recursive work. So come up with a formula in terms of that function t that describes what is the recursive work we do. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and wait for you to answer. Okay, so since there are three recursive calls here, we know we need to do something, like we're gonna have to like three evaluations of this t function, the runtime function. What's the input size that we pass in on each of those recursive calls? It's n divided by four. So this is gonna be how much recursive work? Three times t of n divided by four. 
put all those pieces together, we get our runtime function of t of n uh, is two if n is less than three. Otherwise, it's three times t of n over four plus n plus three, combining all that work. Now, notice a really important point here is that these numbers in the, oops, did not mean to do that. These numbers in the code here, or sorry, in the recurrence, don't necessarily relate to any constants that exist in the code. Like, because there's an 80 in our base case, doesn't mean there's gonna be an 80 in our runtime function. Remember, this t function, this recurrence, is modeling runtime. Now, sometimes the numbers in the code will affect this. Like, when we recurse, we recurse on n divided by four, and so the input size on the next recursive call is one fourth of what it was what it was before. And so hopefully you start to see this practice of pa these patterns we see where we can make these recurrences just from the code. And again, we don't know how to turn this into an asymptotic bound yet. That's our next video. So in our next video, we've just finished writing a recurrence that defines a function uh, that describes the runtime. And now we're going to take that function and turn it into an asymptotic analysis, but in our next video.